Hi, I'm USA Today bestselling author Jennifer Youngblood. Thanks for joining me as I present The Resolve Warrior, the introductory short story to my Navy SEAL romance series. This unique video book featuring original video footage has been made especially for YouTube and is only available to enjoy here on my channel. This series is action-packed with lots of spine-tingling suspense. The narrator, Autumn McNamara, knocked it out of the park. I love her British accents. Something interesting happened to me as I was listening to this series. I found myself on the edge of my seat waiting on bated breath to see what would happen next. Then I laughed and said, you idiot, you wrote the books. You know what's going to happen. The suspense combined with the narration got me so wrapped up in the story that I lost myself for a minute there. I hope you enjoy the books in this series as much as I enjoyed writing them. Be sure and take a second to like the video and subscribe to my channel. The Resolved Warrior Jennifer's Navy Seal Romance Written by Jennifer Youngblood Narrated by Autumn McNamara Chapter 1 Dawn had not yet approached the edge of the steep cliff still shrouded in murky darkness. Sutton Smith stood erect and motionless, the steady sound of his breathing getting drowned out by the monotonous roar of the crashing waves below. He kept his eyes fixed on the rising sun on the distant horizon of the San Diego Bay, which at present was nothing more than a laser point against the hazy streaks of blue and gray. We regret to inform you. Every word of the letter he'd received six months ago was burned into his memory, but those five played on repeat. And after six months, today was the day everything would finally end. For weeks he'd meticulously planned this mission down to the last detail. Now that it was upon him, he thought he might be apprehensive, afraid. But this very second, he was curiously numb, his heart lying like dead weight in his chest. That might change tonight, however, when the deed was upon him. He'd return to this very same spot a few hours after sunset. One jump and it would all be over. The hurt would stop. No more grief. That's what he wanted. For the wretched pain to end. We regret to inform you. He clenched his fist, Doug's face flashing before his mind. Sutton saw him as he'd been as a child, with a cap of shiny chestnut hair and dark eyes filled with wonder. Doug had been a chubby baby, but it didn't take long for him to grow out of that phase into a lanky teenager. Not only had Doug been a tremendous athlete, but he was book smart as well. He could have gone to any college of his choice, which was why Sutton was pleasantly surprised when Doug announced that he wanted to join the Navy and apply for Bud's training to become a SEAL. That moment had been like summiting a peak he'd been climbing for decades. After all the left turns Sutton's life had made, to know that Doug was following in his footsteps, or the American equivalent, had been proof positive that Sutton's life had actually meant something. Doug could have been anything he wanted, and what he wanted was to follow his father's footsteps and offer his life in the name of valor, honor, and defense of freedom. Doug's enlistment would right the wrong that had been done to Sutton and restore honor to the family. Sutton had joined the British Royal Navy right out of high school and would have made a career out of it were it not for the dishonorable discharge. A wound that still stung, because it was totally unfounded. The smear on his reputation had tainted everything and everyone around him. But that was part of life, and especially military life. Sometimes bad things happen to good people and the best intentions landed you on the wrong side of a military court. Even after all that, he could have taken his lashes and moved on. Her face flashed into his mind. Liz's face. The real death blow to the old Sutton Smith was losing the love of his life. He'd gone home, discharged and shamed, to find that the only bright spot in his life had married James, the Duke of Gunthry. After twenty-five lonely years, he still had no real answers why. Only decades of pain watching Liz be named one of the most beautiful women in the world, and always appearing on Gunthry's scrawny arm. Sutton had made a clean break and moved to California. 
The temperate climate with the warm, sunny days was a refreshing change from the damp dreariness of England. With his family's interests in banking, money was no object. So Sutton found a pristine spot of land on which to build a veritable mansion that would have made Her Majesty the Queen envious. Sutton had been born with a silver spoon in his mouth. Like Doug, he could have done anything in the world he wanted. And like Sutton, Doug had been willing to give it all up for God and country. And for some reason that Sutton still didn't comprehend, God had required all from Doug, and taken all from Sutton. When Sutton had instilled those lofty beliefs in Doug, he never imagined they would eventually get him killed. Sure, being a seal was risky, but Doug was well prepared, the best of the best. And yet, in an instant, his life was snuffed out before it really had a chance to begin. We regret to inform you. Sutton's lower lip trembled, bitterness churning like acid in his gut. He would give his life for Doug's a thousand times over if he could. No father should have to outlive his son. Doug had been Sutton's only family to speak of. There was his estranged sister, Anne, whom he'd not communicated with in years. But she might as well have been dead to him because she was no longer a part of his life. Now that Doug was gone, there was no sense in continuing. Sutton had waited six months to make sure he was past the initial shock phase so he wouldn't make a rash decision. But as it turned out, the passage of time had only made him more confident in the path he was choosing. He wondered if Doug would be waiting for him on the other side. A rueful laugh rumbled in his throat. Maybe Doug would be disappointed in him for not sticking it out. Or maybe there was no life after this one. He might just jump off the cliff and cease to exist. Whatever happened would be better than the mind-numbing anguish. How much time passed, he didn't know, but the sun continued its upward climb into the morning sky, gaining size and brilliance as it went. It was a spectacular sunrise, the rays stretching like silver wands over the rippled water as the light gradually increased. Doug had loved coming out here to watch the sunrise, which is why Sutton was here instead of going through his usual early morning weightlifting and cardio routine. It was weird to think he'd never do his usual routines again. Today was a day for remembrance. His mission was to systematically do all of Doug's favorite things. A final tribute to his son. Sutton turned his back on the sunrise and made his way to the sprawling English Tudor mansion. When it was in the construction phase, Sutton brought in an architect from England who oversaw the project to make sure the style remained authentic. The mansion had a stately feel with the aged red brick and intricate network of steeply pitched rooftops. Had it sat next to other homes, it might have looked odd compared to the mid-century modern architecture, so indicative of California. But here, in this secluded spot, nestled on a cliff overlooking the ocean, the mansion was right at home, like it had been here for a century. Of course, using substrates that would give the mansion an aged feel had cost a pretty penny but it was worth it. Even the mansion reminded him of what he'd lost. It was supposed to be a haven for Doug's future family someday. The estate was comprised of two palatial guest houses, an Olympic-sized pool, tennis and basketball courts, and even a bowling alley. It was laughable to think that only two people lived here, Sutton and his housekeeper Agatha, who'd looked after him from the time he was a lad. Agatha didn't know it, but Sutton was leaving the entirety of his estate to her. Whatever she chose to do with it was her prerogative. Twenty years his senior, Agatha had been part friend, part mother, and part sister. She was the only person in this world who'd miss him when he was gone. Over the years, many had tried to ingratiate themselves in with Sutton because of his money. People envied his wealth, lusted after it, believing if they had a hundredth of what he possessed, they'd be deliriously happy. He chuckled humorlessly as he opened the glass door and stepped into the cavernous family room where the ceiling spanned two stories. Yes, on the surface, he looked like he had it made. But that was a lie. Money didn't buy happiness. Comfort, maybe. But not happiness. The smell of sizzling bacon wafted through the house, causing his stomach to rumble. Interesting that the needs of the flesh were still making themselves known, even now. 
He heard the blur of voices from the TV as he stepped into the kitchen and found Agatha at the stove flipping pancakes, her attention fixed on the flat-screen television mounted underneath an upper cabinet. He'd requested that Agatha have breakfast ready at seven, and he could count on Agatha following his orders to the letter. Everything but Agatha's quick-witted tongue was punctual and precise, a tribute to her British heritage. When Sutton named the items he wanted for breakfast this morning, blueberry pancakes, whipped cream, crisp bacon strips, and orange juice, Agatha gave him a puzzled look. She knew this had been Doug's favorite breakfast, whereas Sutton normally had black coffee and toast. Isn't this the loveliest of days, she said. Morning. Smells good. Sutton pulled out a chair and sat down. Agatha thought every day was lovely. Agatha turned, her dark eyes flickering over him. You were up at the crack of dawn this morning. No pumping iron to build up those glorious muscles today? I went outside to watch the sunrise. He reached for the folded cloth napkin beside his plate. He opened it, giving it a brisk shake before placing it in his lap. She nodded, her lips forming a tight, disapproving line. What? Something's off with you, my boy. I can smell it. She frowned and sniffed. And whatever it is, I don't like it. She motioned. No workout? This breakfast? If I didn't know better, I'd think... What? He cut in, eyeing her in a challenge as his anger rekindled. She blinked a few times, rubbing a hand over her apron. That this has something to do with Dougie. His eyebrows shot up, his voice cold and brittle. Just because I requested pancakes and bacon doesn't mean you have to start assuming things. She perched a hand on her hip, her spatula waving out like a flag beside her. I'll assume anything I like, you whippersnapper. And don't you dare give me lip. He barked out a laugh. He would miss his friend. I wouldn't dream of giving you lip. He reached for the newspaper beside his plate. Better to bury his nose in it than get grilled by Agatha. She knew him too well. If she pried hard and long, she was sure to weasel everything out of him. And he couldn't let that happen. Not today. He felt empathy for the turmoil his death would put Agatha through. But she was getting the estate. That would have to compensate for some of the loss. Guilt churned in his gut as he peered over the top of the newspaper at the quirky woman in front of him, knowing money meant little. Her appearance was interesting. Her softly lined face was haloed with a mass of white hair, and her blue eyes had ridiculously long eyelashes. She was in a bright floral dress today. Her smile alone could light up the room, if her clothing didn't accomplish the job first. Agatha had always been so good to him, and she was the only one who made him laugh since losing Liz and then Doug. She didn't deserve all the stress that would result from his death. He reached for the glass of orange juice and swallowed down the guilt with a few hard gulps. He couldn't get sidetracked by emotions. He had to stay focused on the mission at hand. His eyes perused the article headlines, not processing a word. At this point, any events, local or global, were irrelevant. He flinched, lowering the newspaper when he heard the familiar name. Even though his head commanded him to tune it out and look away, his eyes had other ideas. There she was, plain as day on the TV. She was standing on a red carpet surrounded by throngs of reporters all snapping pictures. Liz was as beautiful as ever, only improved with age. Dressed to the nines in a sleek black dress that showcased her willowy figure, she wore her hair down so that the blonde tresses tumbled over her shoulders. She waved while flashing the same regal expression he remembered, the one she put on for the cameras. A sense of nostalgia hit him so hard that it brought moisture to his eyes. He caught a whiff of vanilla, Liz's favorite scent. Felt again the soft flutter of her lips against his. Saw the tender expression of affection on her beautiful face. Then came the rebound wave of hurt, the same that happened any time he thought of her. He'd never loved a woman like he had Liz. He was grateful, and also infuriated that he would catch a glimpse of her today of all days. It was obviously fate's way of reminding him of all that he'd lost. He laughed inwardly at the bitter irony. 
The Duke, who Sutton had been actively ignoring, angled away from Liz to face a different bank of cameras. The commentator chirped about how the Duke of Gunthry and his wife Elizabeth were amongst the attendees at a charity gala to raise money for type 2 diabetes. Just then he caught a glimpse through the carefully crafted facade. Liz looked sad. Haunted. He grunted out a humorless laugh. It was a feeling he got from her on occasion, and he always wondered if he was projecting his own experiences and feelings on her. What did Liz have to be haunted about? Liz was obviously content with her life in the spotlight. Pleased with her husband's title and his blue blood pure enough to satisfy the demands of Liz's father. His stomach tightened as he looked at Duke Gunthry beside her, a proprietary hand around her waist. Tall and thin with dark, perfect hair, the Duke exuded a charming aura. He'd give any American politician a run for their money saying one thing and doing another. Distaste turned his mouth sour. A knife thrust through Sutton's heart when the Duke leaned over and kissed Liz on the lips. The years peeled away and the old familiar hurt was back with a vengeance. How was it possible for a wound to be so raw decades later? He heard a sound and realized Agatha had gasped. Her eyes flew wide open as she looked at Sutton. I'm sorry I wasn't paying attention to the filth they put on the telly nowadays, she said quickly as she reached for the remote and switched the channel. He grunted a response and buried his head in the paper. For a second, he didn't realize Agatha was talking. He lowered the paper to catch what she was saying. For what it's worth, Elizabeth was a nincompoop for choosing that pompous duke over you. Fire blazed in her eyes, and he could tell she meant every word. It doesn't matter, he muttered. Ancient history. She gave him that motherly look. Part compassion and part reproof and he got the uncanny feeling she could see into his very soul. You're wrong, she said quietly. The art's impervious to the passage of time. And despite what you think, all the tragedy that you've suffered will work for your good. You're one of the great ones, Sutton, and I firmly believe the good Lord has wonderful things in store for you. He'll use you as a tool to help others. You mark my words. Open that hard old heart to him. He had to fight the urge to laugh at the most serious words he'd ever heard from Agatha's bright pink lips. One of the great ones? He didn't think so. The only thing God had in store for him was the bottom of a cliff in a few short hours. He realized Agatha was watching him, waiting for a response. She meant well, even though she was misguided. He let out a heavy sigh, putting the newspaper down. Thank you, he said tersely. That was the best he could do. At least he'd been courteous. I'm not just flapping my jaw like an old hag. Sutton couldn't help but laugh. Agatha glared at him and looked like she might say more, but shook her head instead. In an adroit motion, she slid the spatula underneath a stack of pancakes and placed them on Sutton's plate. Next, she put the bacon, whipped cream, and syrup on the table. Sutton was no longer hungry, but he'd go through the motions anyway, for Doug's sake. He was about to dig in when Agatha touched his shoulder. Have I taught you nothing? Excuse me? The prayer! Oh, yeah. Agatha was a stickler for prayer. Would you say it? The last thing he wanted to do was pray right now. Of course. She folded her arms and began with the usual passages, thanking God for the food and their blessings. He expected her to close, but instead she paused for three full seconds. When she continued, her voice was fervent and pleading. Dear God, please bless Sutton. He's a good man, despite his hard heart, and he's been through a heap of rubbish. Help him to find his way. Show him that you care and work a miracle in him to penetrate that hard old heart. Please, Lord, give him peace. She ended the prayer with a hearty, Amen. Amen, Sutton repeated gruffly as he swallowed an unexpected ball of emotion lodged in his throat. What was peace? He hadn't felt it in years. Dig in, Agatha said, patting his shoulder. Chapter Two
A sense of isolation wrapped around Sutton like a tourniquet as he walked through the crowd of people, children's laughter floating mockingly around him. Nothing worse than seeing happy families together. A world of possibilities spread before them when, for him, there was only loss and pain. Disneyland was Doug's favorite place when he was a kid. Sutton had bought season passes every year so they could come and go as they pleased. A grown man alone at Disneyland was no doubt a strange sight. He knew he intimidated people and had a commanding presence. And he caught more than a few parents eyeing him with concern, perhaps fearing he was a predator. He dismissed all outside distractions from his mind as he focused on writing Doug's favorites, starting with a mad tea party, adapted from Alice in Wonderland. Next, he'd ride Splash Mountain, then graduate up to the more thrilling rides like the Matterhorn that Doug had enjoyed as a teenager. Several hours later, Sutton left the park feeling shaken and stirred and went to the Sunnyside Diner. Though it was a greasy joint in a sketchy part of town, Doug had loved coming here to get hot dogs, fries, and strawberry milkshakes, food they'd never really ate anywhere else. Sutton and Doug had stumbled over the diner one evening, having gotten lost in an unfamiliar section of town before GPS was even a thought. Both the food and service were surprisingly good, so they made a point of coming back frequently. Eventually, Sutton got to know Mason, the owner, and a few of the servers, though he'd lost a few hubcaps parking his vehicle in the neighborhood. This place, above all others, reminded Sutton of Doug. As he stepped in through the door, grease from the fryer was the first scent he detected. Then he caught the subtle fragrant whiff of burgers. The diner was nearly empty, only one man sitting at a table. He was bent over, intent on solving a crossword puzzle. He looked up briefly as Sutton walked past, then right back down. Sutton wondered if Mason was here. He wasn't in the mood to talk to anyone, so he hoped not. A few minutes went by before a waitress in her early thirties approached the table. She was a waif with a cap of nutmeg curly hair. Had it not been for the dark circles under her eyes and her haggard appearance, she would have been pretty. Sutton figured the poor woman was probably working herself to death. Being a waitress day in and day out couldn't be easy. Hello, welcome to Sunnyside. My name is Leslie. A polite smile touched her lips. What can I get you to drink? Water with lemon. And coffee. Black. He'd never seen Leslie before. Then again, it had been years since he'd been here. Sutton didn't have a reason to come when Doug was in the Navy. And then when he died, well, that changed everything. Leslie's lips pulled down in a frown. Are you okay, mister? He forced a smile. I'm fine, thank you, he said mechanically. Then saw the genuine concern in her soulful eyes. For a split second they shared some sort of connection, and he got the distinct impression she knew what it was like to truly suffer. To have everything ripped away while everyone else's life went on as normal. Do you know what you want to order, or do you need a minute? He rattled off the familiar items. She jotted them down in her notepad. I'll be back, she said, hurrying away. Sutton scooted into the comfort of the booth. The door opened as a mother with two rowdy boys came in and sat down. Next, a college-aged girl stumbled in, her arms loaded with textbooks. Leslie returned with his water and coffee, then went to the table with the mother and boys to take their order. A blonde, peppy waitress emerged from the back to help Leslie take care of the tables. It was approaching the dinner hour, and it wouldn't be long before the diner was hopping. As Sutton waited for his food, he let his mind wander back to the last time he and Doug had eaten here. It was the day before Doug enlisted. He'd had restless energy about him. While he was excited to join the Navy, he was nervous. Not scared, just hoping that his life would change the world in positive ways. Sutton blinked away moisture and took a long drink of water then chased it down with a few slurps of coffee, letting the liquid burn down his throat. Why had God accepted Doug's death instead of a life which he was so willing to give to protect those who could not protect themselves? That night Doug had teased Sutton, telling him he needed to go on a few dates, find a good woman to settle down with. Sutton knew he'd never be ready for that kind of pain again. He'd met Liz in high school and fallen madly in love with her. He'd given her his whole heart and thought he had hers as well. They planned to get married, knew they'd get married. 
but in a bitter twist of fate like a knife twisting in his heart, Liz married the Duke of Gunthry at the same time Sutton was being dishonorably discharged, plunging him into the lowest time in Sutton's life. Leaving England behind forever, Sutton moved to America and met Jean on the rebound. They married quickly and Jean got pregnant with Doug on their honeymoon. It didn't take long for Sutton to realize that Jean had married him for the money. She had little interest in him, and even less interest in their newborn. Finally, when Sutton came across emails between Jean and an old boyfriend, he had had enough and sent her packing. Jean was all too happy to go on her merry way, smiling all the way to the bank with her large settlement. He'd not seen hide nor hair of her since. Leslie returned and placed a plate of food in front of him, along with a large strawberry shake. She motioned. There's ketchup and mustard in the caddy. Can I get you anything else? He looked at the hot dog and fries. I think I'm good. Thank you. The door opened as a short, muscular rebel type strode in. He wore a surly expression like the world owed him something. Sutton probably wouldn't have paid much attention to the man had Leslie's face not gone rigid. She flinched slightly, fear trickling into her eyes. On impulse, Sutton touched her arm. Is everything okay? He recognized fear. It was his old friend, his mate. Every day he looked in the mirror and saw it frozen in the deep recesses of his own eyes. She nodded, her lips drawing into a thin line. Then she stepped back quickly like she didn't want the man to know Sutton had touched her. The man slumped down in a booth. He was staring straight at Leslie, a hard look on his face. Do you know that man? Yes, she uttered. He's my husband. Sutton noticed that her hand shook as she pushed a strand of hair away from her face and took in a breath like she was trying to muster the courage to talk to him. Everything in Leslie's demeanor screamed apprehension as she walked haltingly over to the man. The inner workings of Leslie and her husband's marriage was none of Sutton's business. He didn't know Leslie, knew even less about her husband. Yet, he'd never been able to stomach a bully. And it was obvious that's exactly what this man was. They began speaking in low tones. Then the man slapped the table with the palm of his hand, causing Leslie to jump. She glanced around like she was embarrassed, then put a hand on his arm to quiet him. He jerked his arm out of her grasp, then drew back his fist like he was going to strike. Revulsion tightened Sutton's gut when Leslie shrank back like an abused animal trying to protect itself from being hit. The man let loose a string of expletives. The woman with the two boys gasped in outrage as she glared at the man. Let's not do this here, Leslie began in a calm tone, like she was trying to reason with a child. The man belted out a raucous laugh. Why? You afraid you might lose your pathetic job? His eyes narrowed to slits. You're worthless. For the first time, in as long as Sutton could remember, he was thrust out of his numb state. He crumpled his napkin in his fist, blood pumping like a sledgehammer against his temples. How we please, Leslie pled. Her face was blotched with red, and she looked like she was trying not to cry. Rage twisted Howie's features as he grabbed her arm, his fingers digging into her pale flesh. Tears sprang to Leslie's eyes. You're hurting me. Please stop. Sutton sprang to his feet, rushing to Leslie's side. Let her go, he growled. Everything in him wanted to pick up this weasel by his stringy hair and punch his lights out. Sutton caught the sliver of alarm that trickled into Howie's eyes. Sutton was in top physical condition and had been trained in various martial arts. He knew it wouldn't be difficult to take the man in a fight. He knew Howie's kind. A coward who got some sick thrill out of beating up on women to boost his low self-esteem. This is between me and my woman. And it's got nothing to do with you. Howie sneered, but he released Leslie's arm, revealing ugly red spots indented with half-moons where his fingernails had been. Leslie stepped back, rubbing her arms. You okay? Sutton asked. She nodded, then looked away. Howie jumped up. This is none of your business. He cursed loudly. Sutton had spent the last six months trying to control the futile rage building inside him, and now he had a target on which to vent that anger. His body tensed as he balled his fists, his voice cracking like a whip through the diner. Me and you, outside, now. 
Howie rocked back, the whites of his eyes popping. You crazy, man! Indignation burned through Sutton as a calloused smile stretched over his lips. You have no idea. I have absolutely nothing to lose. He hardly recognized the murderous tone in his voice. In some perverse way, it felt good to think about hitting someone who actually deserved it, about not having to hold back. You start something with Leslie? You're going to finish it with me. I got no beef with you, man, Howie muttered, backing away. Sutton felt the man's fear ooze out and slither across the floor like a slimy worm. Howie gave Leslie a withering look. You'll pay for this, he said as he pushed past her and practically ran out the door. Sutton turned to Leslie. The poor woman looked as fragile as a house of cards about to tumble. It's going to be all right, Leslie. Tears spilled over her cheeks as she bit her lower lip. No, it's not. The words were spoken so softly Sutton wondered if he'd imagined them. Excuse me? She gulped, her hand going to her mouth as she darted back towards the kitchen. For a second, Sutton just stood there, not sure what to do. His eye caught on the woman with the two boys. Good for you, the mother said, a note of vindication in her tone. He nodded before going back to his booth. He slid in and looked at the food, now cold. It would have been hard enough to eat the food as it was, considering his emotional state. But now that he was fighting mad, it was impossible. He pushed the plate away. For a second he considered going after Howie and beating the living daylights out of him. But how would that help? Sutton would beat Howie, then Howie would go home and vent his rage on Leslie. He hoped Leslie would come back out, but she didn't. Instead, the blonde waitress approached the table and refilled his water. Her eyes sparkled with interest as she looked him up and down. Then her eyes went to his plate. Shug, you didn't touch your food. Would you like me to bring you something else? No, thank you. Is Leslie still here? She jutted her thumb. Yeah, she's on a break. Sutton feared he'd made things a thousand times worse for Leslie by stepping in. He didn't need this today. Maybe he should just leave and pretend it never happened. Even as the thought flitted through his mind, he realized he couldn't leave this hanging. Doug would never walk away from this. He'd help Leslie, at any cost. He'd given his life to help other people. Sutton cleared his throat. Would it be possible for me to speak with her? The blonde shrugged. Well, yeah, I suppose. She's out back behind the diner, talking to her husband. Sutton's pulse ratcheted up a dozen notches, his voice rising. How could you let her go out there alone? You know what that man's capable of. Well, it's not like I'm her mother, the blonde retorted, rolling her eyes. And it's not like Leslie's old man won't find her at home. Chills ran down Sutton's spine. That's exactly what he was afraid of. She waved her arm, encompassing the room. Besides, I've got paying customers to take care of. Speaking of which, would you like for me to bring you your check? She was obviously tired of wasting time on him. No need. Sutton slid out of the booth and stood, retrieving his wallet from his back pocket. He opened it and threw down a hundred-dollar bill. The blonde's eyes bulged as she clucked her tongue. Well, we don't get customers like you in here every day, she chirped, looking at him with new admiration. Sutton went for the door. You be sure and come back now, the blonde said sweetly as he ru- Chapter 3 as he rounded the back of the building, Sutton heard sobbing. Then he saw Leslie, sitting with her back against the brick wall, huddled in a fetal position. Anger burned over him, sending sharp pains shooting up the base of his skull. He whirled around, looking for Howie, but he was nowhere to be found. He stepped up beside Leslie. Hey, are you okay? She jerked, looking up at him. The sight of her took his fury to new heights. Her right eye was swollen and purple, a thin trickle of blood running from her lip. Go away, please, she squeaked, her voice breaking. She gulped a few times, making a wheezing sound as her shoulders shook. Then she buried her head in her knees and continued weeping. Maybe he should have walked away, but it wasn't in him to retreat. He couldn't walk away when everything in him screamed that he needed to help this woman. He sat down beside her, in the dirt of the alley, and let her get it all out. 
When Leslie realized he was beside her, she lifted her head in surprise. The blood from her lip was smeared across her face, tears spilling down her cheeks. She sniffed and used the back of her hand to wipe her nose, which was running like a faucet. Why? She took in a ragged breath and tried again. Why are you still here? She took in more labored breaths, trying to get her emotions under control. Because I could never leave a man or woman behind. I don't understand. You don't even know me. Her shoulders were still shaking. He gave her a tiny smile. I know you're hurting. And that you're desperate. Desperate for it all to stop. She hugged herself, clamping her lips together. He touched her arm. Tell me about Howie. Panic seeped into her eyes, her lower lip trembling. Why don't you leave him? A laugh scratched through her throat. I can't. The sorrow was replaced by a wild look reminding him again of an abused animal. Because you love him? She shuddered. Because he'll kill me and my son. He went cold all over. Why don't you go to the police? A macabre smile split her lips. Don't you think I've tried? She shook her head. You don't know Howie. He has nothing to lose, and he never gives up. Her voice dribbled off into a stilted silence. Sutton ran the options through his mind. He could take Leslie to the police to file a report, but, like she said, it wouldn't do any good. Howie would just take his wrath out on Leslie and her son. Alarm slithered down his spine. There was a child involved. There was no way Sutton could turn his back on this. Today was about honoring Doug, so he would fix this. Then he could go out knowing he'd done something right. How long has Howie been beating you? We've been together almost ten years. It boggled Sutton's mind to think Leslie had been putting up with this for a decade. It was a miracle she wasn't dead already. He's been beating you the entire time? No, he was all right at first, as long as he stayed off the bottle. It got worse a couple of years ago when we found out our son has leukemia. Sutton felt like the air had been knocked out of him. Why, then? He's angry that our boy's dying, I suppose. Blames me. Says if I'd taken better care of him, then he wouldn't have gotten sick. She sucked in a breath. Or that if I earned more money, we could get him better treatment. His jaw clenched. That was ridiculous. Cancer could affect anybody. What type of work does Howie do? He was working at a warehouse job, driving a forklift, but got laid off six months ago when he showed up drunk. The more Sutton learned about Howie, the more he detested the guy. Maybe he should have gone with his first inclination and beat Howie to a pulp. So... Let me get this straight. Howie sits around on his bum, then beats on you, blaming you for your son's illness. She let out a half laugh. Pathetic, I know. She ran a hand through her hair, her eyes bulging. This isn't me. I was never going to be one of those women who let her husband beat them. She cleared her throat, spreading her hands. And yet, here I am. Her brown eyes hardened to black. I don't care what Howie does to me. I just have to take care of my son. Is he being treated? She brought a fist to her mouth, tears spilling down her cheeks. Sutton touched her shoulder. Leslie? Yes. She sucked in a breath. Chemo and radiation, but it's not helping. There's an experimental treatment in Scottsdale, Arizona. It's been yielding good results for Doug's type of leukemia, but I'll never be able to afford it. Sutton jerked. What did you say your son's name was? Doug. An incredulous laugh gurgled in his throat. Seriously? Her boy's name was Doug? This was too much. Moisture rose to his eyes as he blinked it away. A sob escaped Leslie's throat. I don't know how I'll do it. Do what? Sutton managed to get out through his own strangled throat. This was insane. More than a coincidence. She turned to him, the raw desperation in her eyes cutting him to the core. Let him go. Her voice broke as she wiped at the tears. 
I, I don't want to lose my son. Some day a doctor would look sympathetically into Leslie's eyes. I regret to inform you, no parent should ever have to hear those words. Do you think the experimental treatments will cure him? She shrugged. I don't know, but if there's the slightest chance... He nodded, knowing he would have gone to the end of the earth and back if it could have saved his dog. Then it occurred to him that even though he couldn't save his son, he could help Leslie give her son a fighting chance. A flicker of hope glimmered in his chest. He marveled at the feeling, something he thought he'd never experience again. A tiny prick of light had managed to penetrate the dark fog. He turned to Leslie, locking eyes with her. What if I can help? How? she asked, wariness seeping into her voice. But with that wariness came a blip of hope. Where is Howie? She shrank back. I appreciate your help, but you don't know how ruthless he is. You look like you aren't someone to mess with, but he's sneaky. He'll hurt you, maybe even kill you, she stammered. He chuckled dryly. Though unlikely, it would do us both a favor. What? She looked confused. Nothing. He let out a long breath. Don't worry about me. Just focus on helping Doug get better. He offered a smile. Who knows? Maybe you'll find a way to get those treatments he needs. Her lower lip quivered. I pray every day for a miracle. A miracle? That's what Agatha had asked for. Where's Howie? Are you sure about this, mister? She shook her head. You've been so kind, and I don't even know your name. I'm a friend. That's all you need to know. She smiled through her tears. No, you're an angel. Thank you for talking to me. She laughed to herself. <laughs> I'm such a mess. Would you like for me to take you home? No, I need to finish my shift. She rose to her feet, wincing in pain. Sutton also stood. As battered and bruised as Leslie was, he didn't see how she could work. Are you sure you don't want to take the rest of the day off? No, the evening shift will be busy and we're short-handed as it is. She took in a deep breath. I need this job. I keep makeup with me for, you know, to cover up the damage. His mind supplied. Disgust wrinkled his gut. Okay, tell me where to find Howie. She blinked a couple of times. Sutton touched her arm. Let me help you. I promise, it'll be okay. The air seemed to hold its breath as she reached a decision. He didn't say where he was going, but I suspect he'll be at his usual haunt. Jack Riley's bar and grill. She spat out the words like they left a nasty taste in her mouth. She searched Sutton's face. What are you going to do? Her voice sounded small and scared. Make sure that he never hurts you or Doug again. If you could accomplish that feat, then it really would be a miracle. He gave Leslie a nod, knowing this would be the last time they ever spoke. I hope all goes well with Doug's treatment, and that you get your miracle. She hugged her arms. Me too. Sutton left the diner and drove to Jack Riley's. Just as Leslie said, he found Howie sitting near the bartender, punched over, downing a shot of whiskey. Sutton left the bar, then sat in his Tesla to wait. According to the sign posted beside the door, the bar stayed open until 2 a.m. Sutton sighed, leaning back against his seat. He couldn't help but laugh at the irony of the situation. He'd planned this day down to the detail, thought he'd be long dead by now. He never dreamt he'd be sitting outside a bar waiting for some bozo to come out so he could take care of him. He pulled out his phone and dialed his trusted friend, Landry Stevens. They'd served in the Royal Navy together and had an agreement. If one of them ever needed a favor, the other would return it without hesitation. Landry ran a private security firm and was so well-connected that Sutton knew he could help with any situation. Sure enough, when Sutton explained the problem, Landry had an immediate solution. I'll get in touch with my friend and tell him to expect your call. Landry said. They spoke for a few more minutes, 
Landry expressing his condolences about Doug before Sutton ended the call. Sutton couldn't explain it, but something had changed after his conversation with Leslie. Now that he was focused on helping her, his own problems weren't as painful, almost like a miracle. It was empowering to know that he could make a difference in someone's life. Give Leslie and her son a shot at hope. This problem was within his power to fix. Bet you didn't see this one coming, did you, Doug? He said aloud with a chuckle. Well, it's okay. Neither did I. It was after midnight and Howie still hadn't emerged from the bar. Sutton figured the man was so drunk by now that he wouldn't put up much of a fight. Shame, really. Sutton's senses went on full alert when Howie stumbled out of the bar. He tightened his grip on the steering wheel, his mind racing through the process. He wasn't sure where it would go down exactly, but he'd meet the objective. He assumed Howie would get into a car, but was surprised when he walked down the sidewalk instead. That must mean that Leslie lived nearby. This would be easier than he thought. Sutton inched behind Howie, his Tesla moving soundlessly at a snail's pace. The headlights turned off. When he bought the car, he'd figured out how to jailbreak it to get rid of the annoying whine at low speeds that was supposed to alert pedestrians. Who knew it would turn out helpful in a covert op like this? He had to make sure and keep enough distance between him and Howie so he wouldn't get suspicious. He glanced at the storefronts on either side of the street. Even though there wasn't another person in sight, there were still too many street lamps to make a move here and risk being seen or picked up on a random surveillance video. When Howie turned down a dark alley, Sutton's pulse shot through the roof. It was now or never. He pulled behind Howie and got out. He figured Howie would hear movement and turn around, but he kept staggering forward like he was oblivious. He got close enough to tap Howie on the shoulder. Howie grunted and turned. What do you want? He slurred, his arm flinging into the air. He teetered, trying to catch his balance. I told you to... Put it on my tab. Remember me? Sutton glared at Howie. Howie swayed back and forth as he looked at Sutton, his face blank. Then something clicked as his eyes widened in recognition. The man from the diner. The man who has nothing to lose. Howie tried to run, but his reaction time was slow. Sutton caught his collar and spun him back around. Howie cursed and balled his fist, but Sutton executed a quick uppercut to the jaw. Howie laughed, then lashed out, punching and kicking, but he was no match for Sutton. He methodically pounded Howie's face a few more times until the weasel fell to the ground. He bent down and felt for Howie's pulse. Still going. He was just passed out cold. In a flash, Sutton went to his car and opened the boot. Then he picked Howie up and heaved him over his shoulder, grunting in the process. The dead weight was heavy. He hobbled back to the car and dropped Howie into the boot. The empty air around Sutton crawled like ants over his skin, and all he could think about was getting out of here before anyone saw him. He got back in the car and wiped the sweat from his brow. His heart was pounding so fiercely it felt like it would beat out of his chest. He reached for his phone and punched in the number. A man answered on the first ring. Hola. Javier, it's Sutton, Landry's friend. Si, senor. I've been expecting you. I understand you have a package for me. Yep. He'll make a fine addition to your prison. I'd have someone meet you at the designated location. You know where that is? Yes. Perfecto. Park near the road. We'll find you. Adios, amigo. Adios. Sutton hung up the phone, a surge of adrenaline spiking through him. How he would no longer be able to hurt Leslie or her son. Phase one check, he said aloud a smile overtaking his lips as he set his GPS for Tijuana and pulled out of the alley. Chapter 4 Two Days Later It hadn't been difficult to find Leslie's home. Just as he suspected, she lived only a few streets away from the bar in a run-down house on a shabby street. The day before, he'd watched as she wheeled her sick son out to her car, then he followed them as they drove to a cancer treatment center. His heart ached when he saw how pale and thin Doug was. This morning, he'd gotten up at 4 a.m. and darted out the door to accomplish the second and final phase of this mission. 
The diner opened at six and he wanted to make sure he caught Leslie before she left for work. He wondered what Leslie thought about Howie not returning home. She would be relieved, no doubt. Maybe even a little sad, perhaps, that she was closing that chapter in her life. But above all, she and Doug would be safe. Leslie's house was the only one on the street with the lights on. Sutton wondered who Leslie got to watch Doug while she worked. A neighbor, perhaps. He parked in front of the house next door to Leslie's and turned off the engine. He patted the satchel tucked under his lightweight jacket as he pulled the hood over his head and got out of the car. Grateful that it was still dark outside, he rushed up the sidewalk to Leslie's house. He had to get in and out fast before anyone saw him. His heart pounded in his throat. He snuck up the steps and onto the front porch. He placed the satchel at the foot of the door and knocked loudly several times. Without waiting for Leslie to answer, he darted back to his car. He got in and closed the car door just as the front door of Leslie's house opened. She was dressed in her waitress uniform. She stuck her head out and looked from side to side, a perplexed expression on her face. Then she looked down and saw the satchel. She hesitated for a second, long enough for Sutton to fear she might not pick it up. But finally she did. Her eyes widened when she opened it and saw the bundles of hundred-dollar bills. Two hundred thousand dollars. Her hand went over her mouth as her knees buckled. She stumbled back, catching herself on the doorframe. Then she held the satchel to her chest, tears springing to her eyes. Sutton assumed she'd go back into the house, but she walked to the edge of the front porch instead. He realized with a jolt that she was looking right at him. He should have parked farther away, but he wanted to make sure she got the money. He just sat there like a deer in the headlights. A grateful smile curved Leslie's lips as she nodded. Tears were streaming down her cheeks. He didn't need to hear the words to know that she was saying, Thank you. Mist collected in his eyes as he nodded. A look passed between them, two weary souls that had gotten a moment's respite, one in the giving and the other in the receiving. An unexpected blanket of warmth cloaked Sutton as he felt the thing he'd been craving for so long. Peace. In some way he didn't understand, he knew that everything would turn out okay for Leslie and her son. She turned around and went back into the house, closing the door behind her. Sutton started his car and headed home. Chapter 5 Two Days Later He was standing on the cliffside, watching the sun rise when Agatha found him. It's almost as stunning as me, she said quietly. Yes, he agreed, smiling. It is. She turned to study him. The breakfast thing, making all of Doug's favorite foods. You had me bloomin' worried, she hesitated. I was afraid you might be thinking of... She pantomimed a rope tightening around her neck and pulled a grotesque face. His eyes rounded. How did you know? Her features tightened. Cause I'm a smart old broad. I know you. Sometimes better than you know yourself. She pulled her jacket tighter around her. Sutton nodded, looking out at the ocean spreading before them like an endless blanket of glitter. Dougie died doing what he loved. The words caught him off guard as he jerked. He was happy. Dougie dreamed of becoming a seal from the time he was a lad. He swallowed. I know. Sutton couldn't stop a tear from escaping the corner of his eye. She touched her heart. And even though he's gone, I still feel that sweet boy. She paused. Tuggy would want you to buck up and be happy too. The truth of Agatha's words seeped into Sutton like a healing salve. I know, he said quietly. A comfortable silence settled between them. An image of Doug's friend Corbin Spencer came to mind. He'd been more than a friend in truth. They were SEAL brothers, had gone through Bud's training together and served in the same platoon. Even though the Navy had sealed the records surrounding the mission that had taken Doug's life, Sutton pulled a few strings to get the information. Corbin lost it when Doug was killed and went on a shooting rampage, nearly got himself discharged. Shortly after the incident, Corbin left the SEALs. Sutton had to wonder where Corbin was now. 
and the others from SEAL Team 7, for that matter. It gave life to the idea forming in his mind. Agatha ran her perceptive eyes over him. You're different. Sutton cocked his head. How so? There's a new light in your eyes. A resolve that wasn't there before. You found it, didn't you? What? Peace. And your miracle. He didn't need to answer. She could see it in his eyes. She gave him a tender smile. I'm pleased as punch. He watched the fiery ball of sun lift higher, chasing the last of the darkness away. This thing with Leslie had made him see things differently, given him a sense of empowerment that gave way to responsibility. He took in a deep breath and let it out slowly. An idea had been percolating inside him, and once he unleashed the words, there'd be no calling them back. I want to do something, and I'm going to need your help. Agatha cocked an eyebrow, a hint of amusement coming over her lined face. I live to serve. He shoved his hands into his pockets. Four days ago, made six months that Doug's been gone, I want to honor him. I want to use my resources to help people in impossible situations. He chuckled. Who are you and what have you done with Sutton Smith? He sighed. I'm serious. She gave him a sheepish grin. Okay. Can never go wrong with easing sorrow. What I'm about to propose is not without an element of risk. And I'll need your help every step of the way. A twinkle lit her eyes. You mean something other than washing your undies and buttering your toast? He pulled a face. Did you really just go there? She touched his arm and winked. I'm closing my mouth and opening my ears. Excitement coursed through Sutton's veins. This was right. Something he could sink his teeth into. He could make a real difference in people's lives. In some small way, Help right the wrong of Doug's death with every person he helped. It's an ongoing project of sorts. We'll assemble a team of experts to privately help people with problems that are outside of the scope of the police. People who are fearing for their lives. Kidnap victims. Blackmail. Sabotage. Anything, really. What kind of experts are you talking about? The suspicious look on Agatha's face caused a bubble of laughter to rise in his throat. He could only imagine what his friend must be thinking. Probably that he'd lost his mind. Since we're doing it to honor Doug's memory, there's really only one option. Retired seals. Doug's team. Those brothers Doug loved so much. Who loved him in return. A wry grin touched his lips. Chances are... They need to be part of a miracle or two as well. His mind rushed ahead. We'll need to do some renovations on the house. But in a stealthy way, so that people won't realize we're building a fortress. She rumbled out a laugh. Like Batman? Yes. Her jaw dropped when she realized he wasn't teasing. I have the perfect cover, he went on to explain. A social climbing philanthropist. No one will suspect a thing. His eyes met hers. I want to use my resources for good. There are people out there who are desperate for help. He balled a fist. And we have the power to help them. This is crazy, she uttered. He pinned her with a look. You said that the tragedy I suffered would work for my good. That I was one of the great ones. His voice hitched. That God could use me to help others. He took in a breath. Well, it took a miracle. But I'm starting to believe it. And now, I need you to stand by my side. She stood, eyeing him. So, if you're Batman, I'm Robin. I don't think that's it exactly. Hope sprang in his chest. He could tell Agatha was actually considering his proposal. She bunched her brows. I never really fancied Robin. Too much of a ninny, in my opinion. He laughed. Okay, then. How about the Batman played by Christian Bale, where Michael Caine is his caretaker and right-hand man? Well, I do like Michael Caine. Her eyes danced. He's a lovely specimen of a man. Alfred it is. Alfred, you are. 
Agatha let out a deviant giggle. I'd prefer to be Catwoman, but then I'd have to stuff myself into that tiny costume. She wrinkled her nose. Not a pretty sight. They both laughed. Agatha grew serious. Sutton Smith, I knew you'd figure it out eventually. Her eyes shone. You're a warrior in every one of those fine honed muscles. Doug would be proud. Sutton stroked his chin for a moment, then snapped his fingers. That's it. What? The Warrior Project. She looked impressed. It does have a nice ring to it. The Warrior Project, she mused. Agatha straightened her shoulders. All right, when do we start? Today. Very well, but let's have breakfast. Your usual toast and coffee? That would be lovely. Sutton glanced at the sunrise once more, a renewed sense of vigor wicking through his veins. Today was the start of a bold new venture, the beginning of many tomorrows to come. This has been The Resolved Warrior, Jennifer's Navy Seal Romance. Written by Jennifer Youngblood. Narrated by Autumn McNamara. Copyright 2018 by Jennifer Youngblood. Production copyright by Jennifer Youngblood.